This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental Being justice. Human rights issues today. are still... The term Ubuntu. A the Alien and Sedition accident. He's making inferential discoveries. The importance of an archive. The John Hope Franklin Center. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your um, excellent commentary. And also, thank you very much, Professor Ernst, for your engaging presentation. So um, at this time, we're going to open it up to a question and answer from the audience. Um, does anyone have a question at this time? Yes, sir. Um, thank you both very much. Very enlightening. Uh, I'm wondering if you could take us forward a little bit more, since uh, <coughs> communication, especially in, in today's Arab world, is no longer in the, not so much in the print or even on television programs, but in social media. And I'm wondering our, about Arabic as the language of political activism in um, and across Tunisia, to Libya, to uh, <coughs> Egypt. Um, do tweets, uh, Facebook, um, other, uh, other forms of communication, are they in Arabic among themselves? What form of Arabic? Are they in English? Can other people understand? I'm curious about the right. language of political activism today's social media. Do you want me to take that on? Why don't you? Thank you. Um, listen, as, as you well know, Ambassador, there's, there's a classic Arabic that everybody uh, understands from, from Morocco to the Gulf, and then there, there's the, there are the dialects. Now, uh, in social media, uh, of course, English is a dominant, uh, the, do the dominant language used in social media. But now, more and more, I'm seeing Arabic tweets. I mean, they're coming in, 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 in Arabic form. I'm personally not on Facebook, so I can't tell you what's going on on <laughs> Facebook, because my, my children sort of forbid me to. I, I once <laughs> tested the, the possibility that I, I want a Facebook page, and, uh, and uh, we had a revolution at home. So. Uh, <laughs> But, but Arabic, uh, I mean, it, it's uh, the internet. I mean, you can, you can uh, email in Arabic, and, and you can receive emails in Arabic, and you can uh, you know, see every single newspaper, uh, read every newspaper uh, on the internet from, from again, Morocco to the, to the Gulf uh, in Arabic. Uh, the, the social media, the roles it played in Tunisia, and especially in Egypt, was not in English. I mean, it was uh, people were communicating in, in, in Arabic. Uh, I, I don't know if they were communicating only on Facebook, but I'm sure they were communicating in, in many other uh, areas. So Arabic is the language that's used today in what's happening in the Arab world uh, with social media. But I don't know, I'm not, I don't know exactly if it's like in, in Facebook per se, but I know they're communicating in Arabic. Now I tell you one thing as an ambassador, and I find it as a very, very important tool, and I'm sure everybody does it here too. Uh, I can read our newspapers back home, uh, you know, like I was there. Every, every evening before I go to sleep, I can open up and PDF my, my newspapers and but I, I can't hear or feel the crackling of the paper, but I can, you know, click a button and turn the page and read, read uh, you know, the, the, our, our newspapers. So, uh, and, and another thing, Ambassador, I think that you should, you should know and I think is important, the Arab public is very much uh, tech savvy, if, if you will. Uh, and very much in tune to what's going on. And I think more than, maybe it's that because of the turmoil that's in our uh, region, but everybody, from, again, Morocco to the Gulf, 300 million people. Everybody's in tune to what's going on in, the, in our whole region. Everybody follows the news very closely. Everybody is, is, is on one sort of social media or another. Everybody's getting the information they need to get. It's not, nobody's isolated. A person in Morocco knows exactly what's going on in Saudi Arabia. Uh, a person in, in Kuwait knows exactly what's going on in Tunisia. Um, somehow we're, uh, we're interested and, and, and social media gave us uh, the tools to be even more connected. And they're helping us, they're helping, I mean, they're, they're changing the face of, of the Arab world. I asked uh, a person uh, in Washington recently um, this question. I said, uh, rather there was a conversation and then, and then I asked him a question about what he, how he thinks the, the so from a Western perspective, how the social media is affecting us. And his answer was, you know, technology changes things on a political landscape. He said, from his point of view, he said, television in America, you know, helped the civil movement. I don't know if that's true or not. But, but when television came in, uh, somehow or another, it made people more aware of what was going on uh, on, a, on a broader uh, scale, and it helped push forward the civil movement here in America in the, in the 50s and 60s. So, uh, you know, the internet now is, is pushing forward uh, reforms and, and changes in, 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 in our region, because at the end of the day, what moves people is information. Uh, and, and this social media is providing information to people, and people are, are well connected. They understand what's going on. 
and and the whole thing the whole thing uh, happened and something that we learned in the in the middle east that's very important uh, from the, when it first started with uh, that person in tunisia that that burned himself and and ignited uh, the spark that what what uh, for for people what's more important than 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 food and shelter is dignity what what's what's moved the people of the middle east to rise against their leaders and 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 and, and change is not, I mean, poverty was, uh, was of course there, but it wasn't poverty per se. It was the lack of dignity. And that's what sort of brought the people forward. And the social media gave them the opportunity to do what, what did they did. Uh, you know, in the absence of, of, of the internet and, uh, and uh, the ease of communication, I don't think it would have happened in, in, in Tunisia or Egypt or even Libya. Uh, I think it played a very important role. But I'll, I'll go on Facebook and check if it's in Arabic or, or English, if my kids allow me to. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about dialects hmm. uh, uh, within the uh, Arab language. In Italy, for example, the, the dialects are dying. And uh, there was a tendency up to, let's say, 20 years ago to destroy completely. I mean, the people that did not speak the official language were considered literate and uh, encouraging all the official language. In the other world, dialects are as strong as uh, uh, being considered like uh, uh, not part of the uh, the language that needs to be nurtured, or is it not important at all, or is there any study being done with, with dialects that are dying within the official language, the Arabic? Well, there's many different dialects of spoken <coughs> Arabic, which some of which are not intelligible to each other. So it's a it, there's a high degree of uh, what's the uh, linguistic term uh, for variation. variation? Anyway, code, code, code switching. switching. Yeah, <coughs> in other words, people learn the classical language for newspapers for official television and for uh, academic subjects. But there are people who cannot speak in that language. A lot of people are not educated enough to do that. Uh, so we actually have instructors who offer special courses on Egyptian dialect or other dialects because it takes a specialized training to do so. I think going back to the ambassador's question, there. It's interesting to see that uh, dialectal Arabic has been, colloquial Arabic has been very prominent in the social uh, me media and in the revolutionary activities. And I think that this is kind of a natural expression of a sort of democratic uh, movement, which is coming from below rather than from, from above. And it also it occurs sometimes in Roman script, which is easier to type perhaps for some people. Hmm. But perhaps the ambassador. Can I touch upon the, the question? Uh, Ma'am, I, I disagree with you that the, that the classical Arabic is going to die and, and the, oh, and the no, dialects are going to take uh, their place. I never said classical <laughs> Arabic. You're going to depress a lot of students here and they say, okay, <laughs> now we're going to have to study dialects. <laughs> no, but let, let me explain something. Uh, 
dialects vary a lot in the Arab world. There, again, there are 22 Arab countries. If, if I would speak in my language to a Moroccan speaking in his language, it would be like a German talking to a Chinese. We wouldn't understand the thing. But we can all revert back to the, to the classical Arabic. And sometimes the classical Arabic is a bit, you know, uh, tweaked uh, that we can both uh, understand it. But in answer to your question, I don't think dialects are, are, are fading or, or dying out. Unless maybe, you know, a certain village in a certain mountain has, has a small variation of a dialect of themselves and that village everybody's leaving or I mean that very very small variation might might die out but the dialect in itself will not die. I mean the Lebanese speak Lebanese the Kuwaiti speak Kuwaiti the Moroccan speak Moroccan and those dialects I agree with you are getting stronger but uh, but will never uh, replace the the, the classical uh, Arabic uh, I have not seen a lot of newspapers uh, you know printed in local dialects the newspapers, and I read various newspapers from across the Arab world, they're all mostly in, in the classical Arabic, maybe certain smaller newspapers that are, you know, um, trying to be a bit more hip maybe, uh, that, that, that cater to like uh, their own, uh, I don't know, loc localities. They might use um, uh, their dialects, but um, st still the classical Arabic is still very, very much there and very much uh, strong. But again, no dialects are dying. So I'll leave you with that piece of good news. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you very much, both of you, for, for your uh, comments. I was uh, wondering, uh, Mr. Ambassador, that um, so you talked about the oil and the turmoil. What <laughs> comes after the turmoil? Mm. And how does the scene look from Kuwait City and that part of the world mm. in terms of what's happening in, in Syria and elsewhere? Look, we're very concerned. Okay. Now, we in Kuwait, I don't think this Arab Spring that you're seeing will, will, will reach us, and I'll tell you why. The Arab Spring, as I mentioned, uh, the, the word dignity is, is very important. I mean, that's what moved people, dignity. And, but there are uh, two other pillars that also uh, pushed people over the edge, which is lack of economic opportunities and lack of political participation. I mean, if, if you don't have political participation and your livelihood is not good and there's a dictator that's ruling you so your dignity is not there, you're going to explode. And, and that happened. In Kuwait, I don't know if you, how much you know about my country, but we have uh, a good measure of, of democracy. I mean, we have freedom of speech, we have elections, and, and people can participate in politics if, if they choose to. And we have economic prosperity. So those two ingredients, and, and they have their dignity. People live with, with a lot of dignity, of course. But so those two ingredients are, are not there uh, in Kuwait. But the important question that you asked is, is what happens now? Where, where do we go from here? Anybody that tells you he knows is lying to you. <laughs> Honestly, uh, nobody knows where it's going. Hopefully, it'll, it'll get to, a, to a, a better place. But when you look at our region, one thing, one mistake that I've noticed Americans do all the time is they generalize. They generalize. Now, you should not generalize when you're looking at the Middle East. The Middle East is, is again, 22 countries. Tunisia might be a shining success. Egypt might be a failure. Syria might turn to be a success. Yemen might be a failure. So there's no one measure to measure what's happening uh, in, in every country. But this is where I think we're, we're going. You have to keep in mind that, that the Arab countries are young countries. I mean, we, we all got our independence after World War II. There was not one independent country, except maybe Morocco, because it was way off to the, to the west, that had its independence 60 years ago, right? So we come out of... British French mandates after a long history of occupation. I mean, the occupation of the Arab world goes back to, to 500 years. Uh, I, mean, I, I can take you back to the beginning of the Ottoman Empire that, that occupied Arab countries. Anyway, but I'm not going to do that because that's another lecture in itself. Uh, they come out of this, this, this occupation, o occupation kind of period. And the first thing that takes hold in the Arab world at that time was Arab nationalism, naturally. People came out with a very strong nationalistic feeling and, and, and they were roaring to go. Well, Arab nationalism, again, for many, many reasons, failed to achieve people's uh, objectives. Now what we're seeing come up in the region is more or less a religious resurgence in the region. So with the failure of Arab nationalism, I think religious uh, belief is, is, is moving in. And you've seen it in Egypt. We, we've seen the results in Egypt. We've seen the results in, 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 in Tunisia. The region, the, the Middle East, is going to have an Islamic flavor for the next, I don't know how many years. And then, I don't know how that's going to develop from there. 
But those are the facts. Those are the absolute facts that we have in front of us today, that the Islamist movements in the region are coming to power. Because I think people, after coming out of, of, of occupations, after the fail of, of Arab nationalism, uh, religious belief has, has taken hold. And again, religious belief in the Arab world was a, re a refuge to a lot of people that did not have their dignity under previ previous regimes. They found their dignity in, in, in religion. And those forces are now coming in uh, to power. So we have to yet to see where that is, is going to take us. So don't believe anybody tells you, I know where this is going, because he doesn't. Yes, ma'am. I mean, not really. No, not not in the not in the sense. I know what you're what you're driving at, and, and not in that uh, in that sense. Uh, I don't think it's uh, it's playing a, a big role. Unfortunately, I mean, I I, I wish we had more uh, poets and, and philosophers that are you know writing about uh, about our region and, and what's going on in in their way. But uh, we don't. I don't see a lot of them. But again, I'm not in the literary field, or, or so I, I don't know. There might be some some work there, but. Um, again, my world is politics, and that's where I <laughs> spin. <laughs> Perhaps Professor Cook would say something? Well, I just quickly mention um, somebody who might be related to you, um, Suad uh, uh, Suba. Um, She's a poet, yeah. Who's um, a very important uh, poet, um, woman, who has um, written very very, very nostalgic about the past. So um, I think we see a, the, the role of um, cultural producers, maybe not so much the um, fiction artists, um, but poets, musicians, artists, graffiti artists, who played an enormous role in the Arab Spring. As always, the artists, the creative artists ahead of the uh, social scientists. <laughs> Look, I, I believe the majority will be modern, uh, moderate uh, Islamic movements. But you always have the, the, the extremists. I mean, in every political system, you always have the extremists. Now, if, if Egypt is a good example, uh, the extremists are 22% 20, of, of the Islamic movement that came into power. So the majority are going to be moderates, I believe. But there's always going to be the extremists there on the side, you know, trying to pull and tug uh, for their own purposes. The most important thing is for the moderates not to give in to those uh, extremist forces and remain moderate. moderate. And, and, and I, I don't think that the Arab countries can be ruled with extremism, honestly. Uh, so I believe, in, in the short answer to your question is, I think modern forces are going to come. Islamic, uh, Islamic modern forces are going to come. And uh, I think they're going to do well. Yes, sir. Answer to the question of dialects uh, has something to do with your answer. I think uh, to say that um, <coughs> people across the Arab world basically are diglossal. Even That's though true. you speak a dialect, you understand the uh, language of the broadcast. And in this sense, I'd like to ask both of you uh, whether you think, um, to put it simply, the Arab Spring would have happened without Al Jazeera. <laughs> and in the sense, Al Jazeera partly is successful because I think it. Uh, learned many lessons from the BBC, <laughs> on the one hand. Um, on the other hand, um, Al Jazeera um, uh, is able to connect to these different parts of the Arab world precisely because everybody understands the news, newscast or Arabic, whether you speak or not. 
So in that sense, perhaps this Arabic language which we are all speaking, is that something like a, a, a two-edged sword <laughs> in the hands of uh, something like that? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I think you're absolutely right that the uh, there was an amazing effect of communications technology. Just the fact that people could use their cell phones to photograph incidents of uh, state violence and have them uploaded to a uh, television uh, site, you know, has drawn attention in a way which has never been possible before. And so the repression that had been much easier for governments in the past was no longer something that could be done in secret. Uh, so that's clearly a factor. Uh, I, I, I don't think anyone would deny that. Uh, was it the cause, was it this, the single factor? I mean, I don't think we can necessarily say it's just technology because there were times when the internet was being shut down in Egypt and things were still happening besides, outside of that. But, um, you know, the invention of the printing press, we all know the kind of transformations that these had in, in terms of society. It seems like it's happening more quickly now. Uh, but I, just that cell phone in somebody's hand taking pictures, and this was in Iran as well and, and other places. Uh, that's had a powerful effect. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, the short answer again to your question is Al Jazeera played a very important role in, in, in spreading the message of what was happening and, and sort of uh, rallying the people to, to, to the cause, if you will. Um, and as, as for your comment that Al Jazeera is, is, is copying the BBC, uh, the real th truth about it is that when Al Jazeera opened, they took all their people from the BBC. So <laughs> most people working in Al Jazeera come from the BBC to, to start with. So they're not copying it. They're the same people that were doing the work at, uh, at the BBC, but the Arabic service of the, of the BBC. Uh, the question is, would this have happened if, if there were no Arab satellite televisions? I think it would have happened uh, eventually. Uh, I think what, what, the, what the media did is, is pr probably speed, speed the, the, the process up. And uh, I mean, I, I sit here in, 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 in what we all sit here in America, and we can watch, again, something taken over a cell phone on a, on a corner in Syria. And, and, and that would move you. Uh, so if you were an Arab, and if you were uh, living in uh, Syria, and if you had access to, this, to, to Al Jazeera in your house in Syria, and you've seen uh, this atrocity happening you know, a few miles away from you, of course it's going to move you. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no doubt about that. So yes, it did play a role, uh, I believe, a big role. I just have a follow-up question. Sure. This uh, question of Al Jazeera then uh, brings up a very interesting phenomenon of question, especially for people interested in the Persian Gulf, is that with Al Jazeera, you can <coughs> see that there is a certain shift in uh, cultural power, language power, essentially from Cairo to the Gulf. Is it giving Gulf countries, or countries which are not uh, dependent on size and population, or some, but something else, a certain new uh, sway in the, in the Arab world? And, and does this have um, um, <coughs> any kind of double edge? Uh, right. Well, thank you. Again, it's a political question, and I'm, I'm glad to. I mean, this is my, my <laughs> word. Uh, with, with the absence of, of countries like Egypt, OK? In the Arab world, I mean, open the map. There are a few big Arab countries that, that carry weight. Today, in the Arab world, two of those big countries are absent. Iraq is absent, and Egypt is absent. So there's no center of gravity in the Arab world anymore. The, no, there is. But the center of gravity, what I meant to say, is, is you don't have the traditional centers of gravity uh, that we used to have. Now the center of gravity in the Arab world has become the Gulf, the six Gulf countries, because uh, they're stable. They're, they're relatively a, a large mass uh, of land and powerful. I mean, there's, there's, there's financial power there, there's, there's um, oil wealth. So in the absence of, of both Egypt and Iraq, the, 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 the center of power has moved to us uh, in the Gulf. And that brings a very big responsibility upon us. If you see, if you follow the events uh, in Libya, you'll realize that it was Gulf countries that took the lead uh, in Libya. In Egypt, Gulf countries played uh, a role in Egypt, and we play a role through the, through the Arab League. I mean, we're not playing it uh, independently. If you see today in Syria, the Arab League, together with Gulf backing, is, is very much taking the lead uh, on Syria. So we in the Gulf are very, very much aware of this new role that our 
region is taken and should take uh, in, in, in future events. And I hope, I hope Egypt and, and, and Iraq you know, get, get up uh, and, and, and become the, the powers that they used to be very, very quickly. But again, they're not uh, today. I don't know how long it will take them to be up on their feet. Uh, but in the meantime, the GCC or the Gulf Corporation Council, the six Gulf countries, are gaining uh, more prominence uh, in, 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 our, in our region. And Yemen, yeah, of course. We, we, uh, Yemen, we basically solved Yemen. I mean, it was a, a Gulf initiative that, that uh, led uh, President Saleh out of Yemen and uh, give the authority to his vice president. Professor Lawrence? Yeah, I just had one um, uh, follow-up question that, uh, that sounds simple and actually comes from a remark you made that uh, America, of course, is not an imperial power. It just uh, did a good liberation when it uh, came right. to Saddam Hussein uh, out of Kuwait and did another kind of liberation uh, in Iraq, and I've actually been on the stump, not quite uh, in as difficult a position as you are, but where some people uh, push me about a question, they say, well, really, would we have had the Arab Spring without the other two? So the question I want to ask you is, without the eviction of Saddam Hussein from Kuwait, without the American invasion of first Afghanistan and Iraq, <coughs> would we have had the Arab Spring? Yes. The Arab Spring did not start in Iraq, and it did not start in Kuwait. The Arab Spring started because one Tunisian street vendor had had enough and his dignity was 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 uh, was really uh, tarnished and he decided to burn himself in front of a police station and and the whole thing ignited from there uh, i don't know if i'm sure some of you have followed it i don't know if you uh, everybody has has perfect knowledge of how this arab spring started it started with a street vendor uh, selling uh, fruits and vegetables on his cart push cart without a license and the policewoman came up to him and confiscated his cart, uh, and it was his only livelihood. And when he resisted her, she slapped him and took the cart away. And he found no other course except to go and burn himself in front of a police station. And the whole of Tunisia erupted. So even if Saddam Hussein was in power, I think he would have had the same thing that uh, President Bashar Assad is having now. He'd probably have uh, the Arab Spring on his, on his doorstep too. So, uh, no, I don't think that uh, that uh, had anything uh, to do with it. Uh, I think it was uh, spontaneous, and I think it was uh, started local. I mean, there was no, uh, and you know, we Arabs are big on, on, on conspiracy theories. So if somebody did this to somebody. <laughs> there was no conspiracy theory there. It, it started in a very indigenous, very pure kind of way. Uh, people stood up for what they lacked, and that was dignity, basically. Right. Well, the for, let me start by saying that what happened in Bahrain was very uh, unfortunate, uh, of course. Uh, we strongly believe uh, in Kuwait and in the Gulf that, first of all, there are reforms that have to happen in Bahrain, and the Bahraini government knows that and has promised to make uh, reforms. Uh, there's a call for dialogue now on both sides. There's a call for that dialogue from the government, and there's a call for dialogue from, from the opposition. So I hope that that dialogue happens and, and they, reach, uh, they reach agreement. What we in the Gulf saw uh, in, in Bahrain, and that's what, what prompted the Saudis to send in some forces, we saw foreign intervention uh, in Bahrain. Like I was uh, mentioning, in, in Tunisia, in other places, it was a very indigenous sort of local kind of uh, movement. In Bahrain, there are certain grievances uh, in Bahrain. We all acknowledge that. But there was also foreign intervention. And, and that's when the Saudis said, no, we're not going to let this happen. We're not going uh, to let uh, an outside uh, force intervene in one of the GCC uh, countries. And that's why they intervened. Where we stand today is there's a call for dialogue on both sides. Uh, and I hope it happens. There was a, a report. Uh, I don't know if you follow the uh, Bahraini politics very closely. There's a, there's a report. Uh, the government called in um, a person called Bastioni. He's, he's, he's uh, Egyptian. He's American Sorry? He's a famous person in American legal circles. Yeah. Right. Bastioni. Yeah. Sorry, Bastioni. And, and they said, uh, you know, find out a uh, fact finding mission, basically. And he issued his report. Uh, and, and the report puts blame on both sides. So what I'm trying to say is the government of Bahrain is trying to say, 
okay, we know what we have to do. There were some wrongdoings that happened, and we brought an outside uh, entity to look at what happened and, and give us sort of recommendations. So there are steps that have to be taken on both sides, the government side and the opposition side. And I believe, hopefully, that they will be able to sit down on a, on a table and sort of work things, uh, work things through. Um, we go back to the 10th and 11th centuries. Mm -hmm. uh, as you said, Arabic was the vehicle for uh, bringing the knowledge, the um, uh, science, uh, literature, poetry, etc., from uh, the Persian world and the Indian world into the Abbasid Empire. Mm -hmm. um, was there ever any challenge to that, to the use of Arabic, as opposed to, was Persian at that time also a rival language, or was everything just translated into Arabic as English today? Is a, is a <coughs> well, Arabic became the language of the dominant elite, and uh, but nevertheless, uh, Persian survived, and it did so because of a very you know deep rooted culture, uh, which very quickly began to express itself in a new way that we call New Persian, which is written in the Arabic script. And that began to emerge in, say, around the year 900 or roughly a little before that in the eastern Persian uh, areas where there were still Persian nobles who were able to uh, perpetuate that culture and, and keep it going. And, uh, <clears throat> but, you know, actually very literary Persian contains a very high proportion of Arabic in it, uh, 40 to 60 percent. Uh, Although, you know, the big monument of, of Persian literature that emerged uh, around the year 1000 was the Book of Kings, which is based upon really ancient uh, traditions, uh, and it describes the origins of, of Persian kingship with the Persian equivalent of Adam, the first human being, all the way up to the Arab conquest. And so this has a very small percentage of Arabic vocabulary, perhaps 10% compared to the, uh, the rest, but the, the Book of Kings by uh, Ferdowsi was an example of the resurgence. This didn't really happen in any other cultural region that was conquered by the Arabs. And in fact, Persian became, in many respects, uh, <clears throat> as important, and in some cases more important than Arabic, across a very wide range of, uh, of territory from the Balkans to southern India and Central Asia, uh, where it was, it was a language of culture in the, in the Ottoman Empire, in India, uh, as well as you know, among the Uzbeks. And of course, in in uh, Persia proper, so that's a, a pretty big story. It has declined in numbers and so forth as the number of governments go. Uh, you know, well, for instance, today it's only in Iran, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan that it's a major language. But it's one of the few languages in the world that people can still read things from 1,200 years ago and understand them quite. Uh, directly if they're educated. So you're right, that's another important cultural legacy from the Middle East that uh, I would also encourage people to study. Los <laughs> <laughs> Angeles is another place for Persians. The only other thing has to be said along with that is the same time that uh, Professor Ernst mentioned this wonderful um, particular moment in, in uh, what he called the Cosmopolitan past, the Muslim Cosmopolitan past, where you had uh, the conquest of India and, the, and then El Baruni, he mentioned, mm -hmm. writing translating Sanskrit in Arabic, but at the same time, in the same court where Baruni was doing stuff in Arabic, there was this guy who said, hey, Fox on this Arabic. I want to do something in Persian, and wrote the Book of Kings. So the same court, you've got a guy translating Sanskrit into Arabic, and a guy saying, no Arabic, just Persian, and the ruler pays the boat. He paid the guy who did Arabic more, but he still paid the boat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have time for one final question, if anyone in the audience has one last question. I think that was it. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. No? <coughs> I think we're tired. Yes. No? <laughs> so I was just in Egypt last summer, and while I was there, I found I'm studying post hoc the modern standard Arabic, and I found that I couldn't use it with anyone basically <laughs> while I was there. And I found that a little distressing because I'm here, I'm trying to study post hoc, I'm trying to learn language, there's a lot of uh, students that are studying this right now, and Duke doesn't really offer any colloquial Arabic as of now. And so I, I was talking to a friend when I came back, and he basically asked me why am I studying Arabic if 
I can't even use it, and I end up using <laughs> English more often than not. So I'm wondering if you could uh, speak to that. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> I think we need some administrators here to listen to the demand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Speaking for the Arabic program, would you? <laughs> okay. Also, generally, the arrangement we have in the American Academy is for our students to spend at least four semesters of MSA, and then you decide on modern standard Arabic that you want from Egypt to uh, to Lebanon. So in the context of Duke and UNC, we let our friends in UNC, they offer Egyptian dialect and we four. So come and visit. So we ask yeah. our students to take it from there. But the good news I think we have is we are working now internally here to develop one dialect. We're still looking at should we offer Egyptian dialect or should we offer Lebanese dialect. I would also say I'm probably not the most qualified person to answer this question, but I did Duke Engage in Cairo as well, and I remember when I was there, I was like, oh my goodness, I can't speak to anyone. <laughs> and then probably after about a month, and especially because I had the opportunity to spend time in Alexandria, knowing Fasha enabled me to like really pick up the Egyptian dialect a lot quicker, and to the extent that I came back to Duke, and my professors were like, okay, Andy, you need to stop speaking Egyptian dialect. And like, <laughs> back into the talk. So I think it does help, but it, it may just take a little bit. Not that I'm very qualified to answer that question, but just from my experience. Can I add one thing to that? If you want to study engineering or business, you need something like two years of mathematics as a pre-qualification. So if you do your modern standard Arabic, it is like doing the two years of mathematics. After which we can move to any of that. <laughs> okay. Good well, thank you both very much for your time. I know we all really enjoyed the presentation, and I know all of us Arabic majors really appreciated hearing how this will benefit us in the future and the practical applications and the rich history of the language. So, thank you both very much for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.